start to trip over the wire. Um, I'll forget <laughs> that happened. Um, thanks for that great introduction. And um, I also want to thank um, Rosemary Donnelly and Katja Earhart of the Athens Center for um, a lot of inspiration and hard work in um, making this um, uh, presentation and the reading tomorrow possible. <clears throat> and also Alicia Stallings, um, A. Stallings, who does a poetry workshop here in June that is really a fabulous <coughs> class. And, and that actually is the reason I originally came here, uh, which was last June. And I would echo the federal prosecutor in Washington by saying, you know, that was a week that I really appreciated because it was a week totally dedicated to poetry, which I don't often find that kind of time managing a hedge fund. And, um, you know, it was really just a beautiful poetic environment plus the city of Athens, which I'm sure I don't have to tell um, any of you who've been here for the last three months, you know, how much there is here. So um, it all comes together. I'm happy to come back. Um, this presentation actually arises out of a conversation that I had with Rosemary Donnelly, I believe after the student reading on the Friday night of Alicia's class where we were talking about, um, you know, basically the um, uh, various aspects of the Greek um, crisis. And, you know, um, I'm going to give quite a bit of background tonight, but actually um, what I want to emphasize tonight is more the sort of seismic <laughs> shift in global finance to what the World Economic Forum of Basel, Switzerland recently called the shadow banking system. It's a term you can Google. It's actually on the Federal Reserve Board of the United States website since 2007. Uh, the relevant fact to Greece in the existence of this system is that it has more money in it than the conventional banking system of the world. And Greek society, the Greek nation right now, lives in, I guess, a kind of um, contentious relationship with the European Central Bank. And it's not to dismiss the importance of that or the International Monetary Fund. But they don't have as much money, uh, or nearly as much money, as the shadow banking system, which I'm going to go on to define in a few minutes. And the shadow banking system right now is showing very slow, very tentative signs of taking an interest in Greece. Uh, a perception, I believe, that some of the asset prices here have hit rock bottom. Um, the first Greek fund, a uh, Greek hedge fund in world financial history has been started last October in London. It's off to a very strong start. It will be a while before um, you know, the relationships that could be developed with this system would benefit the average Greek. But it would be a very strong um, background um, security blanket should the euro basically disintegrate for reasons other than Greece, which is an everyday possibility, either through um, one of the other uh, challenged countries like Spain um, losing their stability, or th from an election result in a country like Germany or France. You know, um, certainly in England right now, there are strong political undercurrents that they may leave the European Economic Union, which is kind of a I would say a warning flag if there ever there was one about betting your entire national existence on the continuity of the euro. So I'll be getting to that in a little while, but in defining the shadow banking system and giving you um, kind of even anecdotal perspective on it, including the fact, for example, that it totally dominated the American presidential election of 2012. One of the candidates, Mitt Romney, a private equity fund manager, made all his money in the shadow banking system and raised nearly a billion dollars to run for president. Barack Obama in 2008 and 2012 went to the shadow banking system for his presidential campaign funds, opted out of public financing. So you had, among other, and there are many certainly things to criticize, but you had unprecedented in the last presidential election in the United States, an African-American can African -American candidate running against a Mormon. Um, two really, um, you know, um, minority groups in American society that have <coughs> suffered, you know, and especially, of course, as an African American, centuries of prejudice. And this was all overturned by the ability to raise a lot of money, and that money came out of the shadow banking system. So I'm going to try to um, explain in detail what that is, and also um, suggest how its, how its lessons uh, can be applied to Greece. Um, but first, I'm going to take out a few minutes to talk about myself. Following up on that very generous introduction, um, I just want to give a little bit of background. It's an interesting point, I mean, because I think writing poetry and, um, you know, trading in the stock market might look like two um, about as different activities as you could, um, you know, imagine. But actually, in my case, there's, there's a pretty close intersection between the two, which I'm going to explain um, over the next few minutes, and then I'm actually um, 
going to take advantage of the platform and read a poem. Only one, but I'm going to read a sonnet which takes about a minute related to um, my introduction here. I actually began as a child, I think around age 10, to be interested in stocks and about age 16 to be interested in poetry. So these were not shifts I made as an adult. These have been lifelong interests. Um, and I can give you a brief narrative on both. On stocks, uh, I traded um, from around age 15. So I basically traded from my junior year of high school to my graduation from college and did pretty well. I had a mathematical system, which I actually have employed um, in you know, my adult incarnation as a manager. But in the 1973-74 bear market, one of the worst stock markets in American financial history, it wasn't a crash. It was every day a decline for almost two years where you wound up with stocks down 70% from their um, original high. Anecdotally, about similar to the decline that's occurred in the Athens Stock Exchange uh, over the last few years. In fact, maybe a little bit worse. And of course, the US economy did wind up rebounding. I basically gave up at that point for 20 years. Um, I continued to write poetry. I wrote what's called free verse, which uh, many of you may have heard the term. That's poetry that does not have a strict metrical or mathematical underpinning to it. Uh, when I returned to stock trading uh, in the early 1990s and began working with numbers a lot, I found that it started to influence my poetry writing to make it more mathematical. And as a result of that, I turned to metrical form, which involves counting syllables and counting beats, and, uh, primarily to the sonnet. I've published two books of sonnets in the last few years. Um, and interestingly enough, once I started writing sonnets, I then made a further turn in the direction of ancient Greece, which is the whole set of circumstances that has me speaking here tonight. Uh, and that actually was that I took a walk one day and wanted to write a poem. And I dimly remembered from being in college that there was a kind of sonnet called the Petrarchan sonnet. And I misremembered um, Petrarch as Pythagoras and thought to myself, I'll write a Pythagorean sonnet. And I started writing sonnets about the life of Pythagoras, who of course is best known um, in the modern world as the originator of the Pythagorean theorem. But actually the historical Pythagoras was a uh, moral philosopher and a political leader. He was advisor to the king of Magna Graecia, which was uh, the Greek empire on the coast of Italy in the 6th century BC. And he actually also um, was a strong believer in um, the rights of women, the rights of animals, um, and the vegetarian um, rule, which was inflicted, or, or was, depending on your point of view, was um, made a requirement uh, to the city of Cretona in the 6th century BC, ultimately led to his being overthrown. Um, these were all interests, or certainly ideas, that I found interesting. And um, they led then to ancient Greece alongside of um, my interest in the sonnet, which in turn came out of stock trading, which in turn over the last couple of years has focused my attention on um, the Greek financial crisis um, as an observer up until now. As I said, there are actually efforts going, right, uh, going on right now. Uh, the shadow banking system, sometimes also called alternative investments, um, that are of interest to me personally because of my connections to Greece that I am following with interest. Um, anyway, let me read one, um, one poem which relates to this history with the historical figure Pythagoras and then I'll move right into the shadow banking system. Um, this is my book, um, Pythagoras of Love, which was um, published in 2007. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, this poem is called Power Behind the Throne. Emancipator of women and slaves, he treats all animals with dignity, wins influence through his intellect's great fame, guides Magna Graecia long and benevolently. This prince, though, grows reluctant, falls in love with sunlight shimmer, ponds geometry, the formula for trapezoids, oaks weave in water with their branches shadows. He longs for a life of contemplation of ellipses, hawks inscribe on pale blue sky, parabolas that swallow swoop. Insight means more than all a ruler's riches. Light knows more than scholars at the academy and beckons him a colleague to be free. So that's totally invented. That's Pythagoras who gets tired of being a ruler. 
and longs for the poetic life and, and leaves as described. Um, there, there's no evidence the real Pythagoras did that, but there is evidence on the points described in the poem, um, including um, an anecdote in the uh, first century um, historian Iamblichus who wrote that Pythagoras once reprimanded somebody who was whipping their dog by telling him that he might be whipping his uncle. Um, anyway, so that, that's, um, that's really the um, first part. I want to move right into the shadow banking system, explain what it is. And also, um, you'll see as I go through some of these numbers and go through some of this history, how this could be totally relevant uh, to Greece, which is a country that has had no relationship over the last 75 years with the world that shadow banking comes out of. Okay. So let me begin with um, the World Economic Forum, which is in um, Basel, Switzerland. It's an authoritative, um, essentially keeper of statistics that in the, um, the last year, the announcement was actually this year because it lags, it takes time. This is a very secret world that I'm talking about. But they estimated $67 trillion are now in the shadow banking system worldwide. Compare that to $28 trillion of value of the US economy, the world's largest. Okay, and probably the total GDP, of, I don't have this number, but the total GDP of all the countries in the world that is publicly recorded uh, is somewhere in the vicinity of 80 to 85 trillion dollars. So we're talking about a pool of money lying around that basically 99% of the world's population couldn't begin to tell you where it is or what it is. That's equivalent almost to the general publicly stated wealth of the world. What countries dominate the shadow banking world? Well, the United States first and foremost. It's probably got a higher percentage of this world than it has of uh, the general economy, and it invented this world, which I'm going to go into in a minute. But I want to point to a more famous example of how the shadow banking world has changed the realities of the world on finance. And I'm not comparing this country to Greece. There are many differences, but there are also some similarities. Um, the country I'm referring to um, in 1990 was the 28th largest economy in the world. When I was growing up in America in the 1960s, this was a country where you were told children were starving if you didn't finish your uh, string beans or your mashed potatoes. This is a country you're all very familiar with. It has now moved in 20 years, an event that is unprecedented in, in the 600-year history of capitalism, to the world's second largest economy. It is holding approximately one-third of all the treasury bills of the United States, which basically gives it, were it to employ that power, the ability to totally collapse the world's economy overnight. Um, can anyone name the country I'm talking about? China. Yeah, so it, it wasn't hard to get an answer. But um, you can read all the economics history textbooks ever written. You won't find an example of an economy that went from rural, third world, 28th um, in the GDP ranking of 1990 to where China is now. China has taken its core economic strength, which is basically cheap labor and a reasonable technological base, a reasonable education system for maybe a tenth of the population. And it has grown the economy that way. We all know that most of the manufactured goods, I can't swear to what it is in Greece, but certainly in the United States, there are many categories of goods you can only buy as manufactured in China. And I would say that 99% of the world's population thinks that's where China's economic growth has come from exclusively. And that is the driving engine of their growth, but they have taken it and they have, um, to use a phrase that I'm going to use several times tonight, they have monetized it through the shadow banking system. They have the world's second largest hedge fund industry after the United States. Many of their largest funds work hand in hand with American funds. The Shanghai stock market has, is now barreling past Hong Kong and moving on London, and will soon probably be the second largest stock market in the world to New York. The Chinese economic paradigm is to take the um, basic economic strength of the manufacturing, to monetize it in financial instruments, and to sell these instruments for hundreds of times their value, based on the idea that it will only go up. We saw the same thing in the United States and to some extent in Europe in 2008 with the monetization of mortgages based on the principle that they would only go up, where people sold you know, subprime mortgage packages at thousands of times their value because you couldn't lose money because the value would always increase. And of course in 2008, 
uh, we found out what can happen when that goes the other way. And the China, I mean, Chinese growth, I just saw uh, actually uh, over the weekend was the, the estimate the IMF was reduced from 8.1% to 8.0, but that's still 8% growth. <coughs> Europe in the uh, next 12 months is forecast to possibly be as a group in recession. Maybe it'll do a half a percent. The United States forecast downgraded to 1.7. So China's still growing. I think there are people in the world who hold some of these enormous financial instruments who might be asking themselves, is it possible that Chinese growth could retrench significantly and go down to zero? And if you had that happen, you would see in China another version of the subprime housing, uh, general uh, housing price collapse that America saw in 2008, but that's not my point here really. My point is that in this $67 trillion world, you can go in and borrow unbelievable amounts of money and you can leverage and bet on your economic future. And if things are heading in the right direction, you can do what China did. Number 28 to number two, bypassing, we all know about the so-called economic miracle of Germany and Japan after World War II and a lot of the other individual stories and nations in the world. China has passed those nations like they were standing still, because those nations, um, you know, J Japan has a significant presence in shadow banking. I would say Germany, you know, proportional to its, uh, it certainly has a presence proportional to its size. But the phenomenon of China coming from <coughs> rock bottom gets to the following point, which is very relevant to Greece, and that is, it doesn't matter in a world which is essentially leveraging huge amounts of money in the trillions and betting on the direction that instruments will go on. In that world, it doesn't matter what, what something's worth. It only matters, is it going up from where it is or is it going down? So if you believe, for those of you who might be secretly, you know, billion dollar financiers in the audience, if you think Greece is going up from here, Nothing that happened in the last five years or in the last 500 years matters. I mean, that's just a fact. It's not a fact that the general population has been that much exposed to. You had articles on the subprime mortgage, endless articles in the United States. How could this happen? How were these loans written? How did the value of houses go down 30% overnight? But almost nothing on the existence. And I, I want to go into a more explicit definition of what shadow banking means. Um, it refers specifically to three terms you've probably all heard, but probably not everyone knows the definition of, and that would be hedge fund, private equity fund, venture capital fund. American terms originating in legislation that was passed in 1933 and 1940 that have now been imported worldwide. I mean, every European country, with the possible exception of Greece, uh, and a few of the Eastern European countries, has a real hedge fund industry now, but essentially, um, that's a term, it's not a legal term, it's a term that came out of this legislation. It also includes large banks like, for example, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase or, um, you know, Societe Generale in France, um, uh, Royal Scottish Bank, who have one set of books for their customers and their consumers and the regulators, but also keep liquidity pools in trading, um, off-market vehicles that they're not required to report from the same rules. That money globally is stored in many um, fairly obscure financial centers, of which Bermuda is probably the most important in the world, another Grand Cayman Island. Um, the example I want to I discuss a little bit tonight is Ireland, because that's an EU and a Euro member, directly parallel to Greece's circumstances in many ways when they began to list hedge funds on their stock exchange. They are the only stock exchange in all of Europe, EU or not EU, that has significant listings of hedge funds. They list several hundred on the Dublin Stock Exchange. It's brought billions of dollars into the country. It has essentially created a mini industry. It's not job intensive, but it's capital intensive. Hedge fund managers who get wine and dine by the Dublin Stock Exchange and who go there. Um, basically see investment opportunities. They have propped up Irish uh, real estate prices. Ireland has tax collection problems. I won't, they're not as bad as Greece, but they're pretty substantial. They just levied an emergency tax you know, last year when the book started to get into trouble. And my understanding is that only 35% of the Irish people paid it. And that wasn't where people had income off the books. That was people who just refused to send in the check. So, you know, in turn, and I, again, I'm not I, I, by any means going to understate or underestimate the intrinsic, um, you know, financial problems that exist in Greek culture and society. I mean, everyone 
the civilian would come. But I ask you the question, with $67 trillion floating around, why is Ireland the only country in Europe that lists hedge funds on their stock exchange? And again, go to Google and see what the economic effects of them doing it have been. The answer really lies in a combination of the right kind of culture and a country which in Ireland's case was about 30% unemployment when they started doing this, just a, a nexus or a confluence between things are so bad we might as well try this. That combination of circumstances in, that was in Ireland certainly exists here. And you have a stock exchange here that's actually fairly functional on the Athens Stock Exchange. You have no legal or regulatory reason in the world why you could not um, bring in you know, uh, the beginnings of a hedge fund listing operation. The Greek Stock Exchange, although Greece is an EU member and a Euro member, they actually, on um, technology stocks and IPOs, adopted the rules and regulations of the Stock Exchange in Israel about four years ago because Israel has a very um, vibrant, um, you know, essentially, uh, shadow banking, oops, shadow banking related, um, you know, um, stock uh, exchange, and Greece saw that. So there is a progressive, uh, or at least an open-minded element in this country that is interested in doing this sort of thing. It's just been swamped by all the headlines about austerity and all the pressures from the from the EU and its bank. Could you just clarify for those of us who are not economists what the hedge fund is? Sure. Um, I'm, I'm gonna. Um, let me, let me just go directly to that because um, I was spoke before about legislation. Um, it's not a legal term. In the United States, after the stock market crash of 1929, Congress passed uh, a 1933 securities law, a 1940 Investment Company Act, basically to try to make it easier for people to invest in stocks. The American economy was basically dead between the crash and World War II, and this was an effort to um, really just entice wealthy people back into the stock market. It created, the 1940 Act created a 100-member partnership, which was basically totally secret and unregulated. I mean, there's a very short list of uh, obligations that people have in setting up a hedge fund, but there is, for example, no educational requirement for a hedge fund manager. By contrast, if you wanted to sell mutual funds door to door in the United States, you'd have to take really um, tests that involve studying for hundreds of hours. The only requirement for a hedge fund manager is that they have a pulse. They're not allowed, they're not allowed to disclose the names of their investors. They're not allowed to publicly state what their strategy is. They file a document with the strategy, and they're not even legally uh, mandated to comply with that strategy. Over the, and, and then um, the term is actually investment partnership. Um, Business Week did an article in 1947 where a journalist used the term hedge fund and it's now become a global term. It has no meaning um, in terms of the, the law, but it referred to the idea that you can make your investments safer in this unregulated world by taking both sides of the transaction. And that means um, to buy long, which is to buy a stock outright, to sell short, an expression uh, most people are familiar with from, if they know English well, but in the stock market that means borrowing stock, selling it, and then hoping the price goes down. And when it goes down, you buy it back and return it and you make the difference. So selling short, which is actually at the heart of the 2008 housing collapse, and I think 92% um, of the people in the United States cannot define um, when this issue has been surveyed, these are the principles. In theory, you can sell short, you can take um, a long position, you can make money, which either, either way the stock goes. There's a lot of different types of hedge funds now. They invest in a lot of different things. By the year 1990, they had started to become, which is 50 years after the law, they had started to become a bit of a, a factor in the stock market. In 2013, they account for 45% of the daily trading volume of the stock market, uh, both the New York Exchange and the NASDAQ in the United States. They, um, they have about $2.1 trillion under um, management and under something called the Portfolio Margin Rule of the Federal Reserve. They actually can borrow on that um, uh, 16, tri uh, 16 trillion dollars more. So you start to see where the $67 trillion number comes from. In addition, under the same law, private equity, which buys companies directly, and venture capital, which buys companies when they're starting out, 
Those were also partnerships created at the time, very marginal types of entities. Private equity now owns 25% of the major businesses in the United States between stock and outright ownership. As I said, you, you saw with Mitt Romney, the beginning, and, and as, much as, pro, as much as these funds have taken over, okay, um, the American economy on these numbers, 45% of the stock trading, 25% of the um, ownership of private companies, and an astonishing 95% of the new businesses that start in America that are um, successful. 95%. If you don't have the venture capital or the smaller version, angel investor ally, it's almost impossible to start a business in America now. That, that's an enormous number. These three entities come out of the 1940 law. They are basically unregulated. They are private. Interesting point, which I was mentioning to Rosemary before the speech. They don't pay taxes either, by the way. So think about that for a moment. They have a stranglehold on the wealth of the country, but they don't pay taxes themselves. They distribute the profits to their partners, and the partners pay taxes. But if you've got a hedge fund that is making a billion dollars, and they distribute it to 100 partners, and those 100 partners are all wealthy individuals who can offset other losses, who can buy baseball teams, who can you know, do all kinds of things, who can buy art and say it went down in value, you have almost nothing being paid in taxes out of this world, and yet, you know, you don't hear a word about it. I mean, the corporate tax rate is the subject of political discussion in every country in the world, including the United States. But private partnerships under the 1940 law generate more income, and nobody says a word about anyone paying taxes. And, and my final point on this, getting back to the presidential election, is that if campaign finance in the United States remains the way it is, right now. Mitt Romney is the tip of the iceberg as far as who's going to run for national office because we now have a situation where it costs almost a billion dollars. So this shift, which really um, was gradual and subtle till about 1990, but in the last 25 years has become uh, just a deluge. Um, it has accelerated China's economic growth in, a, in just a remarkable way. I'll give you one more example that you're all familiar with. That's London. Uh, where was England in the 1970s? What, what England has done, what the UK has done, is although they regulate hedge funds more than the United States does, and I want to emphasize, there is no country in the world, anywhere, there's about 175 countries, there is no country in the world that regulates partnerships as little as the United States does, and yet, this is almost really half the world's economy. This is, the United States GDP is 35% of the world, and if you look at the money, private partnership world in the United States probably has half the money in the world. And there is essentially no regulation. So when people express sort of surprise about what happened in 2008, or surprise about this, or surprise about that, um, it's really hard to believe that something like that cannot happen again in, in, in the situation we're in. Anyway, the UK, has had this, you know, unprecedented era of affluence now. They regulate hedge funds less than the other European countries, okay? They regulate it more than the United States, but particularly for wealthy people in the Middle East where there's an enormous amount of money because of oil, which, which basically is the backbone of the um, uh, UK hedge fund industry. Financial services in England have gone from about 11% when Margaret Thatcher took office to 38%. 38% of the UK economy is financial services. It's the largest percentage of any country in the world. It's where all their money came from. They were a basically, um, I won't say they ever reached the level that certainly Greece has, Greece has reached in um, recent years, but they were a very broken down financial nation. By the way, I'm by no means saying that any of this is good. I'm not here to recommend you know, that the system is acceptable or that this system is one that was ever democratically voted on, or that most of the people in the world know this situation even exists. But in terms of Greece's own crisis, it does represent some real opportunities. And, I, and the first Greece-oriented uh, hedge fund started last October in London with about $50 million, and the capital in it has gone up to over um, half a billion in the last six months. They're returning, I mean, I think the first quarter, they returned some phenomenal amount, like 28%. These are, remember, they could find one grocery store in Greece that they think 
let's say it was across the street from another store and that other store went out of business, so they think this grocery store is going to do pretty well. Something you can see walking down the street anywhere. They can create a financial instrument of futures options or a credit derivative that only says this is going up. Doesn't say how much money doesn't matter. And they can sell trillions of